Open your Bibles again to our text. Anybody know what it is? What? Ephesians Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Amen. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, or I like to put it this way, the Holy Ghost through the Apostle Paul said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we have been looking just at a part of this verse. There's a whole lot here. And uh, take a long time to discuss everything that's here. But just discussing a little bit at a time. Praying always with all prayer. Or as we pointed out, other translations read, praying with all manner of prayer or all kinds of prayer. And so we've discussed some different kinds of praying or different kinds of prayer that we can find in the Scriptures. And we left off with this verse last time. We got down to this kind of prayer. We talked about the praying, the prayer of faith, or the prayer to change things. We talked about the prayer of agreement. We talked about the prayer of consecration or submission or dedication to God or His will. We talked about the prayer of commitment or casting our cares upon the Lord. We talked about the prayer of worship and praise. And people don't think about worship and praise as being prayer. But you'll notice how the Word of God always ties them together. Thanksgiving and prayer, praise. And one definition of prayer is it's fellowshipping with the Father. Well, thank God when you are praising Him and worshiping Him, you're certainly fellowshipping with Him, aren't you? Somebody said, I don't know who said it, I I heard it almost 50 years ago that uh, praise is the highest kind or the highest type of prayer. Amen. 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 Well, you can understand that if prayer, one definition of prayer at least is, if prayer is fellowshipping with the Father, then when you are praising Him, you are fellowshipping with Him, then that would be the highest type of prayer. Amen. Now, let's talk about uh, the prayer of intercession in 1 Timothy 2, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. If I understand correctly, Timothy was pastor at this time. And Paul says, or I like to put it this way, the Holy Ghost said through the Apostle Paul, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he uh, tells us who the all men are that he's talking about so that we can get it clear in our mind. For kings... And for all that are in authority. In those days, the leaders of nations were more kings. And and so he's talking about those in authority. Explains that. For kings and for all that are in authority. Now why I pray for them. That we, we as Christians, may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, notice this fact, that uh, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Now, there's two things. It's good and acceptable in the sight of God that we lead a quiet and a peaceable life. It's good and acceptable in the sight of God that first of all we make supplication, prayers, and intercession and giving of thanks for all men. Amen? Amen. Now, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, first of all, you're always right when you put first things first. And the reason we get into difficulty a lot of times, even with God's Word, is because we don't put first things first. Now, you know, uh, one of our other texts because we had the two main texts for prayer school. Our other one was John 15, 7, where Jesus said, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Well, you see, if we're not putting God's word first, we're not putting first things first. 
then if we are not doing what God's Word said do, we are not putting first things first. So we need to follow directions. You know, uh, we could say, uh, you know, that we believe in uh, driving an automobile, but that don't mean you can drive one. Amen. Amen. And so we can say that we believe in prayer, but that don't mean that we are a prayer. You got to learn. Amen. 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 And you learn by experience and by, by the Word of God and experience. The Word of God always comes first. So the Word says, I exhort therefore that first. Well, now what does it mean first? Well, he means just put first things first. Even before you pray for yourself. Amen. Did you ever stop and think about that? Even before you pray for yourself. Pray for those that are in authority. See, God will do things for us because we're here. Say, well, they're not even Christians, these leaders. Well, you, you know, you're a student of history, aren't you? You know from, from history that very seldom did you find a king that was a Christian. But you see, God will do things because we're here. And because we ask him. Back over in Old Testament, Jeremiah 33, 3, he said, Call unto me and I'll answer you and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He'll do things just because we ask him and because we are in our covenant and he's established a covenant with us and we have certain covenant rights. And just because we ask him. We'll go into it in detail a little later on in these studies, but you remember in the Old Testament, the 18th chapter of Genesis about Abraham and his intercession for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. And he said, Lord, you know, if you can find 50 righteous there, well, you, you, you know, you, you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked, are you? And you see, Sodom and Gomorrah were very wicked. Yes. See, that's where we get the, the word sodomy. And he said, no, no, I won't do that if I find, you know, in answer. What if Abraham hadn't asked him? See? But he answered every prayer. Yeah, if I find 50 there, I'll spare. Think about that. He'd spare those wicked cities in all of their wickedness for 50 righteous people. Well, then Abraham asked him about, about you know, paraphrasing, well, how about 45? Just, you know, sparing it for 45. All right, 40, fine, I'll do it. 30. 20, 10. You know, I, I, I think, uh, think about that though. That he said he'd spare those cities if he could find 10 righteous people. I, I'm just sort of the opinion that if Abraham had said, well, how about just for Lot's sake, just one, we can find one here. I read another scripture there in the Old Testament and we'll get to it later on too, but just for observation at the moment, where God said, I sought for a man among them. He's talking about Israel now. Just one. I just sought for a man among them to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. In other words, intercede to me that I will not destroy the land. Because see, there's a judgment that comes on sin, you know. And there he infers at least that if he could just found one, if he just found one man, he had spared the land for that one man's sake, him seeking God. Think about that. Think about that. And so uh, that's the reason he said, pray for these kings and all that are in authority. For our sake, he'll do things. We're here. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is acceptable in the sight of God. Good and acceptable. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, there's more involved here too. You, you can't spread the gospel when a nation and a country is in turmoil and war. You're restricted in what you can do for God. Amen? Amen. So that's the reason he said you pray. Notice again that he said supplications 
I exhort therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Well, in one sense of the word, you could say that all of it is prayer in a general sense. But there are different areas and different kinds of praying. Notice here that he puts supplication first. Then he just says prayers. And then he says intercessions. And then he says giving of thanks. I wonder sometime, because in more recent time, I've done a little bit more study along this line. The reason I did is because I said some things by the Spirit. It didn't come out of my head. I didn't know I was going to say it. It sort of startled me when I said it. It started me to think it. I just wonder if we haven't really done wrong by putting too much emphasis on intercessory prayer. In fact, I wonder if we haven't missed it entirely by saying we've got an intercessory prayer group. Amen. You ought to have a prayer group. If they're just making an intercession, that's all they're doing, then they're only one-fourth right. They're, they're three-fourths wrong. Can you see that? Can you see that? See, he said that supplications, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Be made for all men. Now see here, he's talking about all men. Now back up to our, our, our text, our golden text, Ephesians six eighteen. Back up to that and look at that again now. And notice something. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now here he's not talking about praying for all men. He's talking about praying for saints. Notice that he doesn't use the word intercession at all. Notice he doesn't include intercession there. Did you notice that? I said, did you notice that? Yes. Now back up to another verse of scripture that we used. See, I just wonder, you know what uh, Paul said to Timothy? Now, now Philippians 4, 6. There's another scripture we looked at, you remember? Remember Paul said to Timothy, wrote to Timothy, he's a young minister, said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, you just analyze that verse. You could take the negative side. He just said, if you don't study, you're not going to be approved to God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. If you don't study, you're not going to be approved of God, and you're going to be a workman that's ashamed. But then again, he said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, if the word of truth can be rightly divided, it can be wrongly divided. If it has to be rightly divided, that's a reason it has to be rightly divided, because it can be wrongly divided. Amen? Amen. Now, I just wonder, and I said we, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me, all of us. If we rightly divided the word in some of these areas, by perhaps overly emphasizing certain parts of it. Now, I'll call your attention to this fact that here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that we read there, I exhort there first of all, that he's talking about praying for all men, isn't he? I said, isn't he? Yes. Notice in Ephesians 6, 18, he's talking about praying for the saints, isn't he? Yes. And so therefore notice that the word intercession isn't used. See, you really don't have to intercede for the saints. You can supplicate for them. And we haven't done much with supplication. We haven't talked too much about it. Oh, God help us. So he doesn't use the word intercession at all. Doesn't even mention intercession relative to the saints. 
Then in Philippians 4, 6, you notice that he's talking about you as an individual and your needs. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. Another translation, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. See, you're not apt to fret about any of my needs. You don't know anything about them. Or if you did need them, you're not going to fret about them anyway. You've got too many of your own to fret about. Much less fretting about mine. You might as well say amen, that's so. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Amen. Amen. Amen? Notice again, the prayer of intercession isn't used. Is it? No. Is it? No. You don't intercede for yourself. You pray and supplicate for yourself. Well, you can readily see then how folks have gotten off course and really Satan's taking advantage of them. I've heard people say that they were interceding for their ministry. What, what? <laughs> the more you think about that and analyze it, the more stupid it becomes. <laughs> now you can pray about it, Actually, look up the word intercession in the dictionary, and among other things, it means an intercessor is one, sort of a go-between between between two people or two persons that are at odds with one another. Well, you're not at odds with God. That's the reason he said praying for all men, because these kings and all that are in authority are you got to intercede there as well as the other because you're there at odds or maybe even a backslider is at odds with God, but saints are not at odds with God. Are they? No. So in connection with the saints, he said, never even mention intercession. And with the uh, connection with yourself, you, uh, you couldn't intercede for yourself. Because among other things, an intercessor is one who takes the place of another. You couldn't very well intercede for, you, for yourself. <laughs> but I think we put a, an undue emphasis on intercession. I don't misunderstand. I think we ought to get back to simplicity and just call it a prayer meeting. Amen. Did you ever, ever hear anybody say, we got a supplication group? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be just a scripture to have a supplication group as it would an intercessory group. Amen. Wouldn't it? Yes. Amen. Amen. Now go back again there to 2 Timothy. I exhort therefore that first of all prayers are supplications he put first. Supplications. He even put supplications first here. Prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Four different areas of praying. Be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. So then, if all of these is an area of prayer, an area of contact in God, then if we're just interceding and that's all we ever do, then we're only one-fourth right or we're three-fourths wrong. I don't know why we just don't get back to the simple facts of God's Word. And if we are going to meet to pray, just call it a prayer meeting because that's what we did. Amen. We met to pray. And we don't emphasize one above the other. Paul didn't emphasize one above the other. We, we use the thing, we wind up doing all of them. Amen. And then after all, the Spirit's got to get in on that. You just don't do it because you decide that we're going to do this or we're going to do that. No, you're just going to have a bunch of words. Right. Amen? Amen? So why all of it's prayer. Why don't we just simply call it a prayer meeting? And then again, I don't know why some people call it prayer meeting because they don't ever pray. Right. Or if they do very little. Right. Amen. A lady said to me here, the first year we were out here, third year of school, the first year we were out here, 
we just had half of this building back where there was pool star there as a back wall. And so if you can imagine the platform down there and then just off the platform, this lady, we were having a seminar. And in fact, it was a prayer seminar. And, and she came from one of the towns around here, a little larger town. So she asked me, Brother Hagen, may I, may I speak to you? I said, sure. I shook hands with her. She said, uh, well, uh, now she said, I belong to a, a Episcopal church, but uh, I have the baptism, the Holy Ghost, speak with tongues, and most of our church does. In fact, our uh, pastor has the baptism, the Holy Ghost, speaks with other tongues. And so in our town, in our city, we started a prayer group. And uh, she said, uh, most of all of us are Episcopal. We, we started it out of our church. We don't meet at the church. We meet at one of the ladies' homes. And said, we have a few folks from other denominations that come, you know, like Baptists and Methodists and so on. But most of us, the majority of us are Episcopalian. And we even have one or two Pentecostals that come to this prayer group, you see. But she said, uh, I really don't know why we call it prayer group or prayer meeting. We talk, call, call it prayer group that we meet to pray, call it prayer meeting, because said we don't ever pray. That is much. They start off with one little old prayer. She said they spend all of their time prophesying over one another. I said, well, why don't they call it a prophesying meeting? But of course, if you call it a prophesying meeting, any 12-year-old kid one and a half cents knows that's wrong. You got no scripture to have a prophesying meeting. Amen. But she said, uh, now, now what I'm asking you about though, if, if this is right, she said, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't think it's so bad maybe, but said, I always get a bad prophecy. They didn't prophesy anything good. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean now? Give me a, well, she said, they prophesied that my husband was going to leave me. She said, now he's, uh, he goes to church. I'm not going to judge him, say he is saved or not saved. Because I said, you know, just because you're a church member, I've found out now, I used to didn't know it, because you're a church member don't make you a Christian. But said, he's a good man, and he loves me, and I love him, and we have a good marriage. But they prophesied that he was going to leave me. Well, I said, uh, did they prophesy when he is going to leave? Yeah, within a year, he is going to leave. Well, I said, did he leave? No, it's been 18 months and he's still with me. Nothing, nothing's wrong. I, know. I said, well, that's easy, Judge. That's all wrong. And then they said they prophesied my mother was going to die. Well, I said, did she? No, they said she's going to die in six months. It's been a year and she hadn't died yet and is in good health. Well, I said, you can judge that easy enough. You know both of those are wrong. In the first place, they had no business prophesying that away anyway. I said, they had no business of prophesying that away anyway. <laughs> Thoroughly unscriptural. Well, somebody said, didn't 1 Corinthians 14 say, 14th chapter, didn't it say, you may all prophesy one by one? Yeah, but you see, you lifted the verse out of its setting and made it say something it didn't say. To prophesy, according to the first part of the verse, he that prophesies, he said, is greater than he that speaketh a tongue, but he said, He that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Amen. Amen. Well, neither one of those exhorted her, certainly didn't comfort her, <laughs> and surely it didn't edify her. You see, what folks have failed to do is to differentiate between the ministry of the prophet and the gift of prophecy. Amen. Just because you prophesy doesn't make you a prophet. Well, how come us get off on that? Because so many of these intercessory prayer groups run into prophecy meetings. I tell about and refer to it quite often, way back 1943-44, when I was pastor of church there in north central Texas, the black land, and there's a group of ladies, and it's good folks for folks to pray. Don't misunderstand me about that. If they are overseen and directed correctly. And so a group of ladies out of our church began to meet with one of the ladies' house and have a prayer meeting every Wednesday afternoon. Well, one of the ladies, thank God there are, are some that are a little more settled in the Lord. Amen. 
And uh, one of the ladies said to me, Brother Hagin, I, I, I think you ought to get a hold of that. It's, it's getting off. That's about all she said. My wife went. And she said to me, Honey, I think you better get a hold of that because it's, <laughs> it's getting off. Well, I said, What do you mean now to the, to the other lady that came back again? Well, see, they get some kind of revelation. They want to prophesy that. They got the revelation that God was through with me there. That I ought to leave. Well, you can readily see right away that that could create problems. <laughs> Especially if, if God's not ready for you to leave, which he wasn't. That's right. And so I just simply, without trying to say anything about what had happened here before, I wasn't there. I just simply said to the ladies, uh, why don't you bring that prayer meeting into the church? And meet here on Wednesday afternoon and pray. And my wife and I will meet with you. So every Wednesday afternoon we met in the church and after a time I began to teach them. I would teach for a while and then we'd pray. Then try to put in two hours of praying so I'd teach for 45 minutes or an hour and then we'd pray an hour. And I channeled it in the right channel and they became a great force for God. I mean you just better not turn a prayer request into them you know, if it's in line with God's Word. In fact, they wouldn't pray about anything that wasn't in line with God's Word. I mean, if you don't want to, you better be sure that's what you want because they'll get it for you. We had some of the most outstanding, some of the most spectacularly supernatural answers to prayer that I've ever seen or heard. Because it's easy to get a small group in one accord, you understand that, and all agree and believe in together. And, and so they became a great blessing and a benefit to the church. But instead of that, if I hadn't have gotten a hold of it and channeled them correctly, it could have been a great detriment to the church and could have split the church. I know one pastor in California told me that his church split three ways over intercession. Because, you see, they got this group of so-called intercessors I don't think you ought to have a group of intercessors in any church. Well, I'm called to intercede. I doubt that very seriously. We're all called to pray. Amen. I can't see where Paul writing in the churches singled out any intercessors. I think we put an undue emphasis on it until we've got in the ditch over here. And I think maybe on some subjects you almost have to get in the ditch over there to pull them out of that ditch up in the middle of the road. But when you get them up in the middle of the road, don't stay in the ditch, come back over in the middle with them. Are you following me? Amen. And so here, one of the three groups uh, in this church, you see, they, they, they're intercessors and that's their ministry. And they almost feel like, you know, I'm equal to the pastor because I'm in the ministry. God's called me. And then they want to run the church. See, they get all of the answers. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It creates problems. Well, you see, if you're not careful, you'll still you'll do that. You'll get into the ditch on one side or the other. So some pastors, bless their hearts, you know, just cut out all kinds of prayer, in other words, and mess the whole thing up. Church gets dry and dead and cold. and Amen. amen. But around the other hand, if you went the other way, then you get into all kinds of fanaticism and excess. So you just have to maintain balance and stay in the middle of the road. Amen. Stay in the middle of the road. Now again... You ever stop to think about it? Probably haven't. But you can see prayer mentioned, prayer all through the Bible, and then just come into the New Testament, because after all, we are living under the New Covenant. Start in with Matthew and go through, which we will eventually. We started it to begin to do that, and then we switch back over to this, and then we'll come back to the other one and finish with this, because I've got some important things to say to you there. You'll find prayer. Pray and prayer and prayers. More times almost than you can count. Look them up. See how many times it's used. Through the Gospels, through the Acts of the Apostles, 
through the letters written to the church. Then look up the word uh, supplication or supplications. And we found that all three of these sections we've looked at is found there and it is found more than that. Then look up the word giving of thanks or praise. And it's mentioned any number of times. Then look up the word intercession or intercessions and it's only found three times in the New Testament. It's only found three times in the New Testament, intercession or intercessions. But giving of thanks, praise is found more than that. So giving of thanks, if you're going to look at it from that standpoint, and praise and so on, more and worship, more important, and ministering to the Lord is more important than intercession. Amen. Amen. Supplications mention more than intercession. Do you ever think about that? Well, we're not downplaying anything, but we're trying to find balance here because so much has been said about intercession till folks have left the impression that that's the only kind of praying there is and that that's more important than anything. And you can readily see from reading the scriptures that it isn't. Now, first of all, look at it again. I exhort, therefore, the first of all supplications, prayers, intercession. There's only one time Listen to me real carefully now. Only one time in the New Testament are you even told to intercede. Right here. I said right here. But you're told again and again and again and again and again to pray. Aren't you? Amen. I said, aren't you? Amen. You're told again and again and again and again and again to give thanks and to praise and to minister to the Lord, aren't you? Amen. You're told many times about supplicating or supplication, but you're only told one time, right here. It's the only time you're ever told to intercede. That's in relation to all men. Now, the other two times where intercession is mentioned is in Hebrews, the word said, talking about Christ, that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. That's not us interceding, that's him. The other time that intercessions used is in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit. You didn't do it, the Holy Ghost did it. Only one time are you told, but the Spirit. You're not the Spirit, are you? Are you the Holy Spirit? The way some people act, you'd think they were. Now, I never thought of that before. That's all new to me, just as new as it is to you. said, where did you get all of that? Well, not up here. I got it down here. That's where it come from. Amen. Amen. I don't know about me, but I'm saying things I never said before. But I'm ready to be corrected, or you, if I need correction. I want to rightly divide the word, don't you? I said, don't you? Well, you can readily see then that we have not rightly divided the word by putting an undue emphasis on intercession. Now you can understand how people got off and how things got in a mess. I know one of our own Rainbow graduates out in the ministry. And I, I, I didn't know about the, all this happened till last spring. It happened several years ago. But in a meeting, we closed meeting just with our, our MAI folks, he made mention of this and I asked him to put it on paper so I have it. I got his word. I got it on paper. Certain individual came to his church. He's running over 300 in Sunday school or in attendance. I don't think he even had a Sunday school, but in attendance over 300, averaging over 300. Had another church a few miles away is averaging over 100 that he'd started. And so this individual came, a lady, I'll put a question mark behind it, minister. <laughs> and so right in front of the whole congregation, she turned and said to this pastor's wife, God has called you to a worldwide ministry. 
But the Lord shows me, you know, that you're hindered by the men. Don't shout me down now because I'm preaching real good. <laughs> the men are holding you back and the hindrance to you, including your husband. Right in front of the whole church. Well, his wife, you know, she gets all lifted up in pride, and pride goes before destruction because here God's called her to a worldwide ministry. See? So in the home then, the pastor said, Rhema graduate, in the presence of him and his wife, this lady said, now your wife has got to intercede from eight to 11 hours every day for her ministry. The first place, that's ignorance gone to seed. So now then she's got to intercede for her ministry. You don't intercede. You can see that from scripture we looked at. For your ministry, you may have to pray, but you don't have to pray eight or 10 hours a day. You better be studying. Do some praying, put the word first. Because I don't care if you don't know the word, how much you pray, you'll get up and, you know, your mouth won't be filled by the Lord. You'll be filled with a bunch of hot air. And so she said, now your wife, you know, she won't be able to do maybe the housework and tend to the children and, and do whatever has to be done because she's got to intercede for her ministry, so you just go on and do it. Do the washing. Well, like he said, I admit we had some problems beforehand, all right, but it cost me my marriage. It cost me my church. For two or three years, I wandered around almost, you know, and never said anything to anybody, wished he'd come for us for help. We'd been glad to help him, but of course we didn't have RMAI back there then. One reason we started it. Well, God no more called that dear woman to a worldwide ministry than he called you to preach on Saturn. Amen. <laughs> Unscriptural. Unscriptural. But then a lot of time by some of us not saying something, of course I didn't even know about keeping our mouth shut. You see a lot of time people have been hurt, churches have been hurt. You don't intercede for yourself. Amen. Amen. Can't find one scripture that said that. I, 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 I'm just fearful to get away from scripture. I'm on scriptural reference. Amen. Amen for whatever I'm doing, don't you? Not taking something out of its setting. Some verse out of its setting, make it say something it didn't say. Well, I come to find out, though, in the process of time, that really that woman does that with nearly every woman she meets. Another minister right here in Tulsa, minister and his wife. And this minister's wife told my wife and I, because we were discussing this and I read that to him. And she said, well, she told me the same thing. And I almost fell for it, just like that woman did. Almost fell for it. Almost fell for it. She said, I don't know. said, it's just sort of like some kind of a mist comes over your eyes. You can't see clearly. And I suddenly woke up and said, dear God, that's not so. No, no. God called me to stand beside my husband. God called me to back him up. God called me to go with him. I'm not going to go with that. You're going to have to pray. She said to her now, you're going to have to pray, uh, you know, eight hours a day at least, you know, to give birth to this ministry. Well, in the second place, I can't find any scripture about giving birth to a ministry. If you're called then you can develop your ministry. You develop it not by praying eight hours a day, but by studying, preaching, and praying. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen? Now, I said all that to you to show you how we can get off. And like I said, before I've used this illustration, you could take an airplane that would leave Tulsa. It's going to the West Coast, say, Los Angeles or somewhere. And if it's just off course, just a tiny bit. See, not, not much at all. Don't amount to too much at all. Just a little bit off course. If they don't correct that, time they get out on the West Coast, they're way off. 
And that's what happened, you see. Folks spiritually get just a little bit, not much, just a little bit off course, but they don't get it corrected and they just keep going. They just keep going. The further they go, the worse they get. The further off course they get till Satan comes in. And before they know it, they're entertaining his ideas and think it's the Holy Ghost. That's right. Amen. Amen. And they're putting in a lot of time praying, all right, so-called. But most of the time, it's just words and just a bunch of junk and just going on with a bunch of noise. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings. Well, today, we'd say for presidents, for prime ministers, those who head up the government, for all that are in authority. Well, that means all of our leaders here in our country, congressmen and senators and governors and mayors and for all that are in authority. Amen? Pray for them. Pray for them. You know, it's so easy to criticize. Find fault. Anybody can do that. And uh, use your thing. Those folks that are doing all that's not doing any praying. Because if we pray for others, we're not apt to criticize them. And then as Christians, we ought to be concerned about our nation, be concerned about our government. This is our country. We really live here. But right on the other hand, we still talk, we're talking about putting first things first. You still don't put politics before Christ. Now, while I'm at it, I'm going to say something else. You mind me saying it? Just might as well sweep the floor clean. <laughs> Amen. Sweep out behind every door. Pick up the carpet and sweep under it where you've been putting stuff there. <laughs> I've never seen yet, and I've been in the ministry for 55 years, and I've seen it 50, 55 years ago. I've seen it 25, 30 years ago. I've seen it in recent time. Anybody that's really called of God to the five-fold ministry, get into politics that we're ever successful. Amen. Usually they wind up flatter than a pancake, both politically and spiritually too. Now you understand this. I've seen some folks from some of the denominations. Don't know whether this ever called. Doubt very sense is ever called of God to begin with. that went into politics and seemed to get elected. But I've never seen one that called of God and had the anointing on him. If God anointed him to preach, that's what God anointed him to do. He didn't anoint him to politic. Now that doesn't mean that he oughtn't to be interested in politics. That doesn't mean that he oughtn't to, you know, you can't preach politics, but you can do what you can do in these areas to help others and to help people. Better ascertain what did God call you to do. Amen. Amen. Minister down in Texas, good preacher, good church. I mean, he ran, ran up to 4,000 in attendance on Sunday. Charismatic group. He is a Pentecostal, really, of Assembly of God background, but he's charismatic. Church is independent. 4,000. I know he tried to get me to come preach for him. Well, I'd have gone if the Lord said, but I couldn't get in leading the old. But he's led of God to run for congressman. Gave up his church and ran for congressman. He didn't get elected. Uh, if he had asked me, I'd have told him he wouldn't. But he didn't ask me, so I didn't tell him. For years, you never heard him. Just, just virtually ruined his ministry. I notice he's back in now, but he's got a little old church. Maybe he's running a couple of hundred. But you see, you lose that anointing. You lose that edge to preach. It's hard to get back into it. It's almost like starting over sometimes. Are you listening to me? And if you've been out there, it's hard to start over because then you've got to sacrifice like you did to get started. Amen? Amen. Fine line here, but we need to, we need to, we need correction. We need correction. I've never seen a one yet make it. Not one. Not one single one. Not one single one. Some people are so politically minded 
that spiritually they're no good. I mean, if they'd work half as hard for God and the kingdom of God, I mean, they'd really win souls. But to get so busy in this other area until they lose the anointing. And like I said, we're concerned about our country and we're praying about it and we should do that. But in the final analysis, you're not going to help people. Are you listening to me? No eternal good by anything you do in the natural unless you get them born again. Amen. 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 A lady said to me here in the United States, one of our crusades from Russia, she'd come over here and then she'd gotten saved and gotten baptized. Oh, how she got out, I don't know, but she got out. She'd gotten born again, baptized, the Holy Ghost, but she, she still had a lot of that stuff in her. And she said, I don't understand some things. I said, well, what is it you don't understand? She said, well, uh, you, you know, you, you, you ought to distribute wealth, you know. And you ought to be seeing after the poor and doing this, that, and that. I said, I believe in helping the poor all you can. But I said, if the poor, Jesus said, the Bible said, the poor heard him gladly. He said, he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I said, you see, if you'll get this message into them, they won't have to be helped. I mean, they'll rise up, bless God, get a job and go to work. You can see Paul writing to the church there, you know, said, let him the stole steal no more. Let him work with his own hands so they will have to help others. She blinked her eyes a time or two and said, oh, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. I said, that's what we're called to do. Glory to God, glory to God. I believe in helping people all you can. But I'll tell you, the only way you're going to elevate people is really get them to God and set a standard in front of them and an example for them to follow and it'll lift them up out of the dregs of life. Glory to God. Get them on the highway to heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Whether you're getting anything at all out of this. Praise God. Amen. All right, stand up. That concludes this message. For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at www.rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.